mwezidi wa baba sioni mwanga mahali popote Yesu nimefinywa sana It's an honor to be privileged to bring God's word to us as I've been aptly introduced. John Agagwa is my name. I serve as one of the pastors here at Mamlaka Hill Chapel. I lead the Pathway Ministry. So let me just use this opportunity as I begin just to reiterate that announcement. Uh, we will be beginning our online classes on Zoom. Uh, the, the, the subject that we'll be tackling is fighting temptations. So if you're curious about that or that's something that you have been dealing with, which I think is all of us, uh, feel free to sign up. The registration link is on the uh, is actually pinned on your on our comment section right now. So in case that's something you want to do either after or during this service, please feel free to do so. We began last week a series in the book of Acts, actually the, the other week, a series in the book of Acts. Uh, the first was brought to us by Reverend Isaac when we looked at um, an overview of the book of Acts, what it's about and what we are being set up for. Um, and then last week we looked at the character of Peter. So it's not really a series in the book of Acts, it's a character study in the book of Acts. And we looked at Peter and that was such a blessing. Today I have the privilege of helping us look at yet another character. Um, and I will be introducing him shortly. So before we do that, allow us to read the scriptures. In Acts chapter 4. Would you turn with me to Acts chapter 4? Acts chapter 4. You see, there are propositions and prepositions and doctrines that are taught in Scripture. And we do well to go into the Scripture and study those. And every so often, as God grants to preach, those propositions and doctrines. But that's not how God has revealed to us himself through and through. At other times, God has helped us to see how those doctrines and teachings work out in the lives of individuals. The Bible is replete not just with teaching by instruction, it is also replete with teaching by example. And you and I need both in order to mature as believers. What we have done in the book of Acts is we are going to be looking at several teachings of the scriptures, but how they work out in the lives of the examples of the saints and otherwise as seen in the book of Acts. So I want us to read Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4, we'll read from verse 32. Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart, and so, no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. And with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person amongst them, for as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. Thus, Joseph, who was called by the apostles Barnabas, which means a son of encouragement, a Levite, a native of Cyprus, sold a field belong, that belonged to him and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Uh, fast forward to chapter 11 of the book of Acts. Fast forward to chapter 11 from verse 19. Persecution breaks out and people are scattered and this happens. Now those who were scattered because of the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch 
speaking the word to no one except Jews. But there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who on coming to Antioch spoke to the Hellenists also, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the heart of the Lord was with them, and a great number who believed turned to the Lord. The report of this came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem. And they sent Barnabas to Antioch when he came and saw the grace of God. He was glad and he exhorted them to remain faithful in the Lord with steadfast purpose. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. And a great many people were added to the Lord. So Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. And for a whole year, they met with the church and they taught a great many people. And in Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians. And that is God's word. I have had people who want to be, who have heroes in the scriptures. I am one of those. And it wouldn't surprise me if you, like many, have desired perhaps in the Old Testament to be like Moses or Elijah or David, maybe even Deborah or Ruth or Esther or Daniel. Perhaps in the New Testament you have been those who have related with Peter and John and James perhaps even Paul or Mary or Martha or Priscilla or Apollos or Dorcas. But in all honesty, I have seldom come across one that has called Barnabas his hero. In fact, unlike many of the above, Barnabas needs a fairly decent introduction because most people are not actually acquainted with him. And no... It is not Barabbas, who many of us know, the insurrectionist. It is Barnabas. In Acts chapter 4, where we read, he is introduced to us in verse 36. He was a Levite, a Hellenistic Jew. A Hellenistic Jew was simply a Jew who was born in a Greek state. In this particular case, he was born in Cyprus. And so he was a Jew by birth, but he was a Greek by culture right? He's a Levite, we are told. Um, He is amongst the first members of the early church in Jerusalem. And later, as we shall see, he will serve in the church at Antioch periodically. So this helps us to realize that what is true of the church is true of Barnabas. When we are told about the church in chapter 2, that they continued in steadfast prayer, that they continued in fellowship, that they continued in the apostles' teaching, put Barnabas there and those things describe him. Barnabas is one of those few people. And his actual name, as is introduced to us, is actually Joseph. Chapter 4, verse 36. His actual name was Joseph, but the apostles nicknamed him Barnabas. The apostles nicknamed him Barnabas because of his character. Barnabas is a Greek word. It's actually a play of words. What it really means is a son of consolation or son of encouragement. That's what they called him. Now, in those days, they didn't give people nicknames based on how they sounded. They gave people, they gave people nicknames based on their character, based on what they were like, right? And so it is of absolute importance for us to see and to realize what is happening here. They're actually telling us something unique and real about Barnabas. Barnabas is an encourager, so much so that's what they call him. That becomes his nickname. And this would be a good point perhaps to ask you, if your friends were to give you a nickname based on your character, what would it be? If your friends were to give you a nickname based on your character, what would it be? And then, even more importantly, would it stick? In the case of Barnabas, it stuck. In fact, later on, as you read the story, you never remember that his name was Joseph. You only remember that this is the son of encouragement. He was a good man in Acts chapter 11, verse 24, that we read. This is how the Lord describes Barnabas. He was a good man full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. He was a good man, 
full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. No one else is referred in the book of Acts as a good man. No one else is referred as a good man. Everybody else is referred by other names. And so it's important for us to see that this is a unique character in the New Testament. He is a unique character in the New Testament. And so it behooves us to study him. Hebrews chapter 13 verse 7 says, Of such men we are told, consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. So, Barnabas is primarily called the son of encouragement. The son of encouragement. So what does this mean? And so I want us to look at three things that we learn about Barnabas in his encouragement. Firstly, he is, he en he is an encourager by his possessions. Secondly, he is an encourager by his presence. And thirdly, he is an encourager despite his perils. He is an encourager by his possessions. He is an encourager by his presence. He is an encourager by his perils. Firstly, an encourager by his possessions. Now, if you follow the book of Acts, you will see that Luke is trying to give us, all through the book of Acts, about 30 years of church history. He has limited papyrus read that he is writing on. And he has so much to cover. And so Luke has to choose what to put in and what to leave out. I bring this up because it's important for us to realize that in Acts chapter 4, the passage that we have read is actually telling us something that he seems to already have told us in chapter 2. If you read chapter 2 from verse 42 to 47, this unity of purpose and heart and mind that the disciples had in the beginning had been emphasized. This sharing of resources to cater for the needs of the poor amongst them has been emphasized. And so that Luke feels the need to repeat that aspect of their lives means that he would only repeat it if he feels it is of dire importance for us to consider that. And so he's not just telling us necessarily by way of information. He is teaching us something about the Christian's attitude towards his possession. In this text, we discover that Barnabas is a man of means. He owns some land. He is numbered amongst those who had houses and lands. In fact, later on, we will discover that John Mark's mom, John Mark was Barnabas' cousin. Mark who wrote the Gospel of Mark, right? Mark is Barnabas' cousin. His mom owns a house that is big enough to fit a, a, a group that was described as many people that are praying when Peter was arrested, right? So John comes from, a, I'm not sorry, Barnabas comes from a fairly wealthy family. These guys are well to do. He owns land, his relatives own big homes. So he's a, he's a relatively rich man. But much like today, the church had both the rich and the poor. And sadly, it had more poor than rich. Barnabas, amongst others, was deeply moved, the scripture says, by their plight. In verse 32, we are told now, they were of one heart and one soul. In other words, when Barnabas looked at others, the poor in their congregation, in their meetings, and how they were going without basic necessities, he was moved because it was like his pain. The, the scripture says that they were of one soul. This reminds us of the story of, of, of Jonathan and David, how the Bible says their soul were knit into one. This is what Barnabas feels about the others, and the others feel about Barnabas. Now, we know that Barnabas doesn't have liquid cash at the time. He doesn't have the money. So what does Barnabas do? Barnabas does something different from what you and I would usually do. When needs arises, you and I usually look into our immediate context and see, okay, this is how much I have. Barnabas says, well, maybe I have something, but it is not enough to meet the need that I would want. It is not enough to meet the need that I am seeing amongst God's people. So what does Barnabas do? 
the scripture says, he goes and he sells his piece of land and he brings the money to the apostles' feet so that it will be used to meet the needs in that congregation. Now, that phrase brought to the apostles' feet doesn't necessarily mean they took the money and put it at their feet. It means they brought it under the apostles' authority. Now, we have to remember that at this time, the church has grown to about 5,000 people. When they started, it was a smaller group. And so it was almost practically impossible to know who needed what at what point. And so they developed this central kitty where they would bring all the money to the leaders. And then the leaders would, by use of other leaders under them in chapter 6, would be introduced to deacons. They would also, you know, investigate and know who needs what, and then they would distribute it. And so that's the mode that they use at this time. Barnabas, the scripture says, because of this that he did, the the apostles called him the son of encouragement, the son of comfort, the son of consolation. You know, many of us think of encouragement in terms of words. The brother said to me some very encouraging words, and that's true. Encouragement can come in form of words as we shall later see, but see Barnabas. Barnabas encourages the people primarily, firstly, with his deeds. Long before Barnabas encourages with his words, he encourages with his deeds, with his generosity. You see, here is what you and I know. When you are hungry, when you are going without some basic need, Receiving a text message that says, God is with you, and God protect you, and I hope things will turn out better for you. It might be an encouraging word, but even more encouraging in that situation will be a text that starts with P5XX21 confirmed. In other words, what we know in those times, it is better to encourage with an actual gift that meets the need than with the mere words. And this is what Barnabas did, does. Barnabas does not love in word only, but he loves also in deed. You see, in the scriptures, we are called to see some of the people whose giving is highlighted for various reasons. For example, the widow in the temple who Jesus said she had given far more than others because she had given out of her poverty. The Roman centurion who the disciples came and told Jesus, the Jews came and told Jesus, this man built a synagogue for us. We are, the giving of Cornelius is highlighted who used to give alms to the poor. The giving of Dorcas, who used to knit sweaters, I think, and then she will distribute and give amongst the people in the church. They are gifts that God highlights because he wants to teach us something about how to relate with our possessions. And Barnabas is one of them. Barnabas lets us realize something about our possessions. This could not have been an easy gift to give. You see, in those days, this was Barnabas' security, right? This is his security. The scripture speaks to us about the importance of land in those days. And so when Barnabas is selling his land, he is really looking at the present need in the congregation. And he is saying, okay, I have that land. I was going to sell it or I was going to ensure that my, 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 my portfolio is set. But Barnabas thinks about it and he says, I'm going to do something different. I feel God lay this on my heart. I am going to give up that to meet the needs that are here presently now. The Bible says that he gave because of the need. The scripture talks about as any hard need. That word need there means as many as were destitute. These were not as many as had desires. There was no brother in the church who hoped he could build a swimming pool behind his apartment. These were serious needs, basic needs, hunger, food, sometimes confiscation of property because of persecution. 
And Barnabas sees the need is great, and so his sacrifice is great. The question is, why does Barnabas do this? Well, the Bible tells us they continued in the apostles' teaching. This tells us that the apostles taught these things. It didn't just happen spontaneously. One of the reasons, and I think that one of the things I think sometimes we think about the book of Acts is that these things just happened. No, 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 no. The scripture tells us that the apostles taught. They will teach them these things. The question is, what did they teach? Did they teach that all Christians should sell everything? No, that would have been impractical. First of all, it would be untrue because we are told here that they sold their property as need arised, arose. rather. So, uh, for example, in the book of Acts chapter 2, we know that that happened. Again, here in Acts chapter 4, it happens. Later on in the book of Acts, we will see that people still owned lands and houses. For example, in chapter 12, we will make, meet Mark's mother who still owns her home. So it means in this occasion, she did not sell her property. In chapter 16, we'll meet Lydia who becomes a Christian. And when she becomes a Christian, uh, she invites Paul into her home. And Paul goes into her home and Paul doesn't say, you need to sell this home. No, they stay there. Later on, the church in Philippi will meet in Lydia's home, right? So the teaching of the scripture is not that every Christian should sell everything and give to the poor. If we did that, then soon enough, we will have nothing to give to the poor because we will have sold everything. That's not the teaching of the scripture. Yet, this is still instructive about how we should deal with our possessions. In Luke chapter 12, verse 33, Jesus says this, Sell your possessions and give to the poor, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Now, Jesus is not speaking here to the rich young ruler. 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 I have said it. Ruler. Right? Right? He is not speaking to the rich, young ruler. <laughs> I had to say that slowly, right? Um, and dealing with a particular issue of idolatry. He is, not, he is speaking to his disciples. He is making a categorical case. He is saying, you sell your property. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Now, obviously, we know that Jesus, for example, uh, didn't sell everything. He had clothes. He had a house in Capernaum, by the way. Uh, when he said that, when the Lord said um, that the Son of Man has no place to lay his head, it was while he was on journey. Uh, because many times the Lord would be um, on mission. And so they would have to hope that somebody would be blessed by their message and they would spend at their home um, and in that case, he didn't have a place. They had no accommodation. They had no place to lay his head. But Jesus had a house. Uh, the Bible teaches that. His house was in Capernaum, actually. Uh, when John's disciple met Jesus, they asked him, Master, where do you live? And he says, come and see. And then the Bible says after that, they refused to go back to John. But that, that's not the point. He had a house. So he didn't sell his house. Uh, in fact, it's very likely that the roof that was broken uh, when Jesus heals the, 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 the paralytic that was dropped, it's very likely that that was actually his house, um, which is why he would have excused that uh, particular issue. But that's not the point. He had a house, he had clothes, he had belongings. He doesn't sell everything. So what does Jesus mean when he says that we are to sell our belonging? I think the key to understanding what he means is in that phrase, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Jesus is saying that how you deal with your possessions, how you deal with your possessions will reveal where your treasure is. And where your possessions reveal your treasure to be, there your heart will be also. Now, this is particularly instructive because what he's telling them is this, then sell your possessions and give to the poor. In other words, use your possessions as an instrument to love the poor. Use the things that you own as a way to express love to those that are needy, to express love to the poor. That's what Jesus is teaching here. So your treasure reveals your heart. So here's the truth. If you treasure people more than money, you will use money to serve and love people. But if you treasure money more than people, 
then you will use and step on people to get money or you will hold money and possession even when people are languishing or you will just not use your possessions to serve and love people. In Romans chapter 12, verse 13, we are told, share with the saints in their needs. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 12, the scripture says, work so that you might have to give to those in need. The Bible calls us to think of our possessions as gifts and instruments that God has brought in our hands to be of loving service to others. The scripture says that when Jesus went to Zacchaeus' home and Zacchaeus gave up half of his wealth, the Lord said, salvation has come to this home. In other words, Jesus was saying, because of how Zacchaeus has started to deal with his money, I can see that his heart has been changed. His treasure is in a different place. And here's a good question to ask yourself. Do you treasure money more than people or people more than money? See, there are two ways to live as far as possessions are concerned. You can either live as though this is my hard earned money. These are my possessions. Or, as one Andy Stanley put it, this is the very definition of greed. It is the assumption that all that you have is for your consumption. If this is your mode of thinking about money, my hard earned money, if that's how you think about money, then the only question you ever ask about your possessions is this. How can this money move me forward? And the question to you I would ask is this, how different is, you, is that from the, gent, the pagans who do not know God? Even they do the same. But the other way to think about money is the way Barnabas thought about it, the way the early church thought about it. They had all things in common. Their possessions were only an instrument to serve and love others. They asked the question, how can my money help others who are in need? Jesus told us it is more blessed to give than to receive. See, because of such a costly sacrificial giving, look at what the scripture says in verse 34. There was not a needy person amongst them, for as many as were owners of lands and houses sold them and brought the proceeds. The scripture says that there was not one needy person in that church because of the sacrifice of men like Barnabas. You see, this is God proving to us that if we will be willing to live by the word, if we will be willing to live by the scriptures, even the socioeconomic problems of our day can be resolved. You know, I always tell people that poverty is man-made. Poverty is not something that God made. God put so much wealth in this world. You and I would probably agree that if every single individual lived like Barnabas, there would be little, if any, poverty at all. And the scripture says here that there was not one poor person amongst them. Not because of anything, because of men like Barnabas, who did not see possessions as things to hold on to, but as a means to love and to be a blessing to others. This scripture is the evidence that we need but I fear that there are more needy people in the church and in the world today because there are far less people like Barnabas. You know, here at Mamlaka Hill Chapel, I think it is important for me to, at this point, just commend our giving. Uh, I think it was last week or the other week when Reverend Mwangi was able to, uh, as he was leading service, mention and say 
that if you are a part of our congregation, if you are a member of this church, don't go hungry. Do you know why Reverend Wangi can say that? Because of the giving that you have given. Because of the giving that you have given, in a sense, you have figuratively brought it to the apostles' feet and we can confidently look at you and say, please don't be part of our congregation and be in that kind of need. Come. And to that extent, we are so grateful that you have taken up that mantle. And to that extent, we are like Barnabas. But I would also like to exhort and to remind us that this is not a responsibility only for the few. The scripture reminds us that all should put aside according as God has prospered them. Not everyone has land to sell, but everyone has something to give, the scripture says. And all of us have to play a role. We have to be involved in the furtherance of God's kingdom and in taking care of the needs of those that are represented, not just in our families, but also in the world around us. You see, Jesus said as a categoric principle that those who do not gather, scatter. If you are not to the extent that you and I are not like Barnabas, to the extent that you and I are not healing the fabric of society by doing things like these selfless ways of dealing with our possessions to help others, to that extent we are contributing to the problem. So let me pause here and ask you this question. Imagine if the world had more people like Barnabas. What would that world be like? In fact, let me bring it closer home. Imagine if the government in our country had more officials like Barnabas, like maybe of the 200 or so officials, if 150 of them were like Barnabas. What a country it would be, right? Right? 